Bartram. Okay, welcome to this uh, online video session uh, to add a little bit of depth to the discussion that we're having this week on uh, the protection of marine mammals and offshore resources. One of the things that I want to point out, and I know that this is pointed out to some degree in both the reading and the lecture material, but something that I want to highlight is the impact that these two particular statutes that we look at in the protection of marine mammals, the impact these statutes have overall on policy directions, essentially what they really mean from a policy standpoint about the protection of marine mammals. If you recall, if you remember our hierarchy of laws, I have it summarized here in the upper left-hand corner. If you remember, there is the constitution, laws, and regulation. And generally speaking, we can look at this relationship, the legal hierarchy here, uh, between uh, the different types of law, the Constitution as a subset of law, uh, laws which include statutes at both the federal and state level as a, another subset of law, and then finally regulations as its own sort of unique subset of administrative law, which has its own uh, relationship. But if we look at these three different types or categories of law, we can see that constitutional law is essentially the supreme law of the land. It sits atop, the sea is at the top, which means that it preempts any statutes or L's or laws, uh, whether they be state or federal laws, that directly conflict with constitutional principles. And certainly um, both the Constitution and the L laws, the statutes, they both preempt the R's, the regulations. And the reason that this is important, this hierarchy, is to understand how this relationship plays itself out. What I mean by that is the very fact that this relationship exists and understanding this relationship between different categories of law helps us understand the impact, the role, that framework, the relational framework between different categories of law has on policy directions. In this case, we can look to the right here. I've, I've identified three different boxes. I have a small box here, a medium-sized box, and then a large box. And I have above it this identifier that suggests that Congress has choices. And Congress itself um, has choices. And when we're talking about Congress, we look immediately to the L's. So we're talking about statutory law. And what I mean by Congress has choices under law, the L's, is that over here, Congress can give the agency greater degrees of freedom in implementing statutory goals. So what we're talking about now here is the delegation doctrine, which was examined earlier in our review of materials. And the delegation doctrine uh, suggests that Congress can pass laws that delegate the responsibility of implementation of those laws to an executive agency. The, and that's essentially where the R's are derived from, the rules or the regulations. So, for example, I think we mentioned uh, a while back that under the Clean Water Act, the goal of the Clean Water Act, which is a federal law statute um, that was passed by Congress, the goal of that act is to restore and maintain the biological, chemical, and physical integrity of the nation's waters. That's its major goal. The way in which the statute goes about obtaining that goal, of actually getting to that goal, uh, is left in many ways to the executive agency, mostly in this case, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. So the Clean Water Act delegates the responsibility of achieving the goal of restoring, maintaining the physical, biological, and chemical integrity of the waters to the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. That means that the agency is then, under the Clean Water Act, empowered to enact regulations that meet that goal. The boxes in this example here these three boxes suggest that when Congress decides to delegate responsibility to the agency, it has choices. It has choices in how much responsibility, how much essentially degrees of freedom it gives to that agency. 
So the first box, the smallest box, suggests that Congress is, is being highly prescriptive. It's prescribing in its statute most of the responsibilities itself. So it's leaving less to the agency to interpret and create rules for implementation purposes. Uh, the middle box suggests that Congress is, uh, is, is giving more discretion, so the statute is a bit more ambiguous in terms of how to get there and leaves that ambiguity to the discretion of the agency to figure out if we're thinking of ambiguity in terms of getting to the goals of the statute. And then finally, the largest box suggests that Congress is being substantially deferential to the agency, giving the agency a lot of room making the statute very ambiguous as to how to get to its particular goal. Therefore, the agency has a lot of discretion, the most discretion. On, the larger the box, the more discretion the agency has. And that's the suggestion here. But not just in terms of delegation. We can also look at the statute itself. And we can say that not only does Congress have choices in terms of when it passes a law, how much discretion to give an agency in implementing the goals of that law. But Congress can also directly place limitations on the law itself, can make the law have a wide breadth of application in some instances, and otherwise, or contrarily, have a very narrow, defined breadth in other circumstances. What I mean by that is Congress can pass a law that covers a lot of ground. It's a law that encompasses a lot of things. Or Congress can choose to have a very limited law that it passes and only covers a very specific thing. And we have to think about that because when we're doing statutory interpretation, when we're engaging in that action as policy analysts, let's say, and we look at a statute, one of the things that we beyond having to understand what the statute means, right, and what it applies to beyond that, once we've mastered the intention of the statute, the language of the statute, we can sort of sit back and start thinking about it in broader terms. And what I mean by that is we can think about the role that the statute is having, the, the sort of impact it's having uh, as in terms of what it applies to, the sphere of influence that the statute has in a particular area. Sometimes we might find that a statute is very limited, has a very small sphere of influence over subject matter. And because of that, because it's so limited and maybe so specialized, um, we, we find that that law as a legal framework has limited application or limited uh, effect over an area that we might be looking at in the broader sense from a policy standpoint. On the other end, if we find that a law has you know, wide breadth of application, it applies to a lot of things, has a substantial sphere of influence, then we might say that that law um, you know, has potentially, from a policy standpoint, a significant impact on a particular area. Certainly, the areas that, if you recall um, from some of my uh, earlier discussions, you know, areas that clearly fall within, as this red X is meant to represent, clearly within the defined area of the statute that Congress passed, for example. Uh, so this is one way to try to understand um, both the immediate effect of statutes in terms of its broad application, and also when we're thinking about the delegation of responsibility to an administrative entity uh, the, the amount of delegation given to that entity under a particular statute. And that's the purpose of putting that here. Now, the interesting application is, uh, is identified more closely here below. Here we have two examples of um, a situation where we, we have a, a continuum, let's say. And on one side of the continuum, we have um, an area that's encompassed here that suggests that there's harm occurring to the environment and vice versa there's a area here uh, where uh, there's a protection of the environment and the suggestion here is that so where does the statute or the regulation depending on whether we're looking at a direct congressional passage of legislature would be the statute 
or if we're looking at an agency's implementation of its statutory authority, which would be a regulation. Either way, what we're looking at here is we're trying to see along this continuum, is it more likely that this particular statute or regulation harms the environment or protects the environment, or does it balance harm of the environment and protection of the environment? And in some instances, we might find boxes, as these different boxes here are meant to represent, if I get this up straight here, um, oh goodness. we might find boxes that look something like this, these three examples here. And what these examples are meant to represent are, I'll erase this here, are whether or not um, the statute or regulation uh, harms the environment or protects the environment or does a little bit of both to a different degree. In this instance, in the first box here, we see that it's about equal. We see a statute that represents uh, both some harm to the environment uh, while it's also protecting some aspects of the environment. This could be either a statute or a regulation. I'll just call it this uh, legal mechanism. Okay. And so one of the questions we can ask ourselves along this continuum is, well, it looks like this legal mechanism uh, essentially balances equally harm against protection. So that's an interesting, and, and we might understand why, if we put it into context, um, we might know that environmental statutes, uh, in order to protect the environment, might also harm some things that we care about, which might be, for example, economic activity. So some statutes balance harm against protection somewhat equally. And this is one example of this. By the way, uh, for those of you that might have taken the environmental law course, you'll remember this as the introductory material into the course, or some of this as introductory material into how environmental statutes or environmental laws are created. And those that haven't understand that that course uh, delves into this uh, discussion in significantly more detail. But anyway, so we have here an equal example of harm versus protection. At the lower box here at the bottom, we notice that in this particular statute, there tends to be more harm to the environment allowed than protection. And uh, we might understand those are cases where the statute might be favoring um, economic considerations, direct economic values, let's say, for example, over environmental considerations. And we've dealt with a number of examples here in this course in terms of uh, offshore oil and gas development might be one example where the focus is on the development of the resource and not necessarily, not necessarily, its impact on the environment. Although it considers impact to some degree, we can see in terms of where it sits along the hash mark that it rank orders, let's say, or gives less weight to the protection of the environment than it does to the harm of the environment. So that's a way to sort of analyze uh, environmental statutes or regulations, right, these legal uh, mechanisms. And then finally, we have in the, in the, the, the middle uh, square here, it's wholly protecting the environment. So we have an example here where the statute or the legal framework itself is only meant for the protection of the environment. Now, these are special cases. These are statutes that we can say, regardless of its economic impact, we know that it protects environmental values. And certainly, um, we have some understanding after the reading this week that the, uh, for example, this is working out correctly here. It doesn't seem to be working correctly. Um, let me put it out here. Okay, well, anyway, that the, uh, it this way. Sorry, it doesn't seem to be working as well as it normally does. But the, uh, okay, that looks terrible. I don't know why. Uh, let me go ahead and erase that. Anyway, uh, something that might be an example. Um, let's see if I fixed it here. Yeah, it's a little better might be the, all of my writing is going to be horrible. See, this is just not working at all. Okay, the ESA, the Endangered Species Act. So in the central square, we can identify the Endangered Species Act as one statute that we're now dealing with in terms of marine mammal protection that wholly protects environmental assets, regardless of the economic impact. 
As a matter of fact, it does this even though there might not be any uh, economic um, benefit to the particular species under protection. In other words, the only criteria for the species to be lifted under the Endangered Species Act is that it is either threatened or endangered, regardless of its use by humans, or to be honest with you, regardless of its aesthetic quality even. Um, and what I mean by aesthetic quality is uh, maybe the, uh, the particular um, animal has no tourism value, has no existence value as far as human aesthetics are concerned. What I mean is that it might also have ecological value outside of our aesthetics. So we might not think of the thing as really cute, really interesting, something we want to see, something we want, you know, we're not talking about Shamu or um, dolphins, uh, you know, maybe uh, an endangered echinoderm, um, uh, a starfish maybe, maybe those are interesting, but uh, a sea cucumber or a nudibranch, something that we normally don't deal with and we kind of maybe think even are icky or gross uh, if we ever encounter them in the marine environment, but um, maybe like a jellyfish for example, right, or a tinafore, these sort of comb jellies, these gelatinous, uh, nasty things in the water that we might not really care so much about. Um, if we find that that particular species is either threatened or endangered and it gets lifted under the Endangered Species Act, it meets the requirements of the act as implemented by uh, the executive agency implementing the Endangered Species Act, then it becomes a listed species regardless of its economic value its direct economic value. Uh, again, one of the reasons we do this is because the Endangered Species Act is unique in the sense that it identifies in ecological values, that it says biodiversity in and of itself is an important goal of humanity, maintaining biodiversity. Kind of like how the Clean Water Act explains that maintaining the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the, of the uh, nation's waters is a primary goal. The Endangered Species Act takes that same principle, takes it from water and applies it to species that are about to either are threatened or about to go in extinct, as far as we can tell. So it's unique. It's extremely unique because it's a statute that sits wholly within the protection environment realm. We can also look at the Marine Mammal Protection Act and we might be able to say many of the same things. It's unique in many ways because it's sort of a subset of the Endangered Species Act in the sense that it's solely seeking out marine mammals, just marine mammals. And I know I make I mention of this in the, uh, in the notes and in the lecture materials, um, but it, I mean, it's something to think about. I mean, we, we have no equivalent of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. We don't have the Terrestrial Mammal Protection Act, for instance, right? Uh, we don't have this special law. Uh, that protects all mammals that exist on land uh, in the United States jurisdiction. Uh, so maybe that's one way to think of how unique the Marine Mammal Protection Act is because, um, and certainly it doesn't apply to fish, it doesn't apply to crustaceans or other marine organisms, only marine mammals, right? Uh, sharks are not protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, so something to think about that, you know, we have this unique subset of uh, species, mammals in marine waters uh, that we give special protection to. And we can think about some of the uh, probably political lobbying efforts that went into that, the reasons why we have a special law directed uh, squarely at marine mammals. And, you know, by the way, of course, the marine mammals do not have to be either threatened or endangered to fall under protection under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So when I say it's a subset of the Endangered Species Act, I didn't mean to suggest that they either have to be threatened or endangered in order to qualify. What I meant is that the Endangered Species Act uh, applies to all species, at least specifically all uh, fauna, all uh, animals. Uh, uh, but the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, you just have to be a marine mammal and you automatically qualify, even if there are plenty of you and you're in no danger or threat of becoming extinct. So we could also find that the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the way in which it protects those marine mammals, a secondary consideration. So once you qualify for the act, what protections are triggered, harming, harassing, those sort of things. Um, and there are exemptions, right? Um, you'll note in the uh, materials that there are exemptions in which uh, marine mammals can be harassed, even taken, killed, that sort of thing, um, under special permitting for Inuit activities, for example. And I have in my, uh, I talk about in my paper, that you read in this section on international trade, uh, some of the reasons in which there might be these sort of ex exceptions uh, to the um, 
to the taking of marine mammals, although that's dealing with Canada and international agreement, um, there are also international protections uh, for certain types of uh, uh, marine mammals and other species. Um, but anyway, uh, so it's kind of interesting to think about these statutory categories and how they can apply wholly within a particular category. And so what's the, what's the impact of this? Well, I think simply if we look at uh, the way this looks here and we say, okay, so if I have a statute that I'm looking at, and this statute uh, might be one that um, I categorize as wholly within this sort of category here, protection of the environment, then I can, you know, I can, I can look at it and say, well, it wholly protects the environment. That's its intention or that's its effect, one or the other or both. And now I can look back and see what Congress's uh, intended goals in passing the legislation or a state legislature if it happens to be a coastal state. Uh, and then I can also look at how the administrative entity is implementing these goals to create this situation. In other words, if the reason uh, the protection of the environment seems to be wholly favored, um, it might be because of the regulations, the rules that are being created by the administrative entity. And I might want to look at those rules and try to match them back to congressional intent to understand this legal framework in greater detail. Because if I can understand its effect by categorizing it in this way, I have a better understanding of what it applies to. Once I add that effect to something up here, for example, if uh, in the upper um, box up here, I can identify that, you know, not only does it wholly protect the environment, but it has a broad and substantial coverage or sphere of influence. Now I have a significant legal framework. For example, if I'm looking for a law, a legal framework that has a strong breadth, a wide breadth of application, and also, number two, wholly protects environmental considerations with complete disregard of any sort of economic impacts, right? So it doesn't harm the environment, not any harm of the environment whatsoever. If I can establish these two criteria in a statute, now I have a legal framework that meets maybe the requirements I'm looking for in order to favor a particular policy direction. And the alternative, um, I can look at something here. I can look at a statute that has very little breadth, right? And I can look at it here, something that wholly uh, harms the environment. And to be honest with you, that's not an example, but I can put a box up here. And we could have a box where it sits wholly within the harming of the environment. And I can say that statute uh, is something that, you know, is either an impediment to a policy direction that I'm looking for, or it's wholly supportive of a policy direction I'm looking for. If I'm looking more for a balancing approach, I can look at something more here. I can say, well, this one is more balanced. Uh, and, you know, maybe it has a, a small breath, a medium breath, or a larger breath. So, Within this one sort of slide context, I want you to take home the idea that, wow, so I can apply statutory frameworks to these two different criteria. One, how much choice, how much sphere of influence has been given in the creation of this regulatory regime, this legal framework, for example. And then number two, uh, to what degree does it balance the harming of the environment against the protection of the environment? Does it wholly harm the environment? Does it allow whole scale harms of the environment? Does it balance equally between harming the environment and protecting the environment? Or does it wholly protect the environment or some ratio in between? Is it 80-20, 20-80, depending on what you're looking at? Some relative ratio. I think this is a good way of just trying to understand how these conceptual frameworks, which exactly this is, helps us to begin to think about the larger implications of legal frameworks as we apply them to our policy areas. So for this week, and certainly for the weeks we've already gone through, but for the material that we also have yet to discover, think about this conceptual framework and how it applies to the different laws and regulations that we review. Okay, thank you so much.